Welcome to Side Notes. I'm the host of Reginald Argue. I'm sitting here today with an extremely inspirational individual, member of parliament for the Parkdale High Park, Sherry DeNoble. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to allow us to do this interview, Sherry. What I'd like to uh, talk about is that you're a massive advocate for the Habitat for Humanity and also helping out the poor. You also have a story behind that. When you were a youth, you were homeless yourself. Could you talk about that? Sure. Um, I, when I was 15 and on, I was out of the house. And in my instance, uh, I think people sometimes are, are a little unclear about what forces kids out onto the street. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're kicked out. Uh, sometimes they're just so poor they might as well be out. Uh, in my case, it wasn't either of the above. It was a very traumatic household, very traumatic family situation. My um, stepfather had shot himself, and I had found the body that tells you the kind of household I grew up in, uh, very volatile and very crazy. And quite frankly, I just found it safer. I felt safer to uh, couch surf on my friends' uh, sofas if I could or sleep in the park if I had to than to go home. And that's also a very, very common cause of why kids end up on the street. So when you see kids on the street today, it can be any of the above. Most people think, well, they're there because they're addicts or they drink too much. Um, not necessarily the case. That might be a byproduct of being on the streets, but it's not usually the cause. And you also battled uh, uh, drug abuse yourself. When you're talking to the youth uh, nowadays, uh, is there something you could share with them in regards to that might be able to help them? They're going through battles of homelessness and drug addiction themselves. Yeah. Uh, number one, there's hope uh, and there's help. Number two, there's hope, always hope, uh, because you're not who you are in this moment. You are always who you could be. And uh, who you could be is anything you can dream of being. So that's number one message. Uh, and number two, uh, I'll say, is that there is help available. I managed to trip across it myself as a youth. I remember stumbling into the Fred Victor Mission back then. Uh, they fed me. I met a phenomenal man named Reverend Swicker, who was a United Church minister, passed on long ago. Uh, but he also helped me in a very non-judgmental way. I knew doctors who helped me in a non-judgmental way. So there is help available. Uh, and again, you know, you've got youth on your side if you're young. So uh, there's lots of hope, lots of hope always. And, you know, uh, carrying on through your, your life, uh, 1992, I think it was, when you actually went into the ministry, you mm -hmm. left a corporate job. There were some traumatic uh, circumstances surrounding that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've had a lot of death in my life. I mean, my uh, my parents are dead. Uh, my brother died a long time ago, and my husband died in, from a bike accident uh, on his Harley coming home late at night from work. Um, traffic accident, died. So I found myself a single parent. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not anything I'd w wish on a worst enemy. So, but I, I think, you know, my, my trail to ministry really began before a tragedy in the sense that I ran my own business, I was making a lot of money, I'd realized my material dreams, and I remember thinking that if ever a job came across my desk, because one of my job was as a corporate recruiter, as headhunter affectionately called, that I would leave my own company and go do it if it was better than my job. Never saw that job uh, until I walked into a United Church and still a friend, um, met with a minister there, Reverend uh, Ken Gallinger and thought after we had attended for a while, eh, his job is better than my job. Didn't pay as well, not nearly, but it was a better job. And so I thought, hmm, interesting. And that was before Don died. So I had already started going back to Emmanuel College, started in, didn't know I wanted to do it full time at that point. Um, the death and everything that came after really pushed me faster along that path. But, uh, but certainly the path was already before me. And you also did a radio show. I, I love the title of this radio show. I think it was called The Radical Reverend. <laughs> yes. What were some of the guests that you brought on during that show and, and some of the topics that you touched on? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I, I wanted to do a show. There's nothing like it anywhere, and there still isn't that I'm aware of. I was on for 10 years doing that show. And I'm on again now, by the way, on a show called Three Women, just a plug for that, uh, every Tuesday morning, 9 to 10, uh, CIUT again, 89.5 FM. But back then, I really wanted to do a show that made religion accessible to, to folk. Uh, I always thought when I walked in church that I wanted to walk into a church where I didn't have to leave my brains at the door. And I did, and I found such a church, and there's many such churches. And that was part of my path to ministry. 
So I wanted to be that person that dealt with all of the kind of reform and interesting topics that people in religious circles deal with uh, from sort of the left end of the spectrum, as it were. So I had uh, every religion imaginable on my show uh, from every end of every religion imaginable and all sorts of religious issues on the show that we were dealing with. Uh, but I, I mean, I think... You know, for Jewish uh, watchers of this program, uh, I had Michael Levine, who's uh, the editor of Tikkun in New York City. He's probably one of the best known people in the world from the reform end of Judaism, very activist, peace activist. Um, I had lots of Muslim activists on my show. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I had everybody on that show in 10 years, really. I, I, I can't kind of point to one. But but it, it was it was fascinating to do that show. And now I'm now that I'm in political life, I'm doing a more political show uh, that's focused on getting women before the microphone and talking about what they do in politics, so all levels of politics there. And there's two groups, groups that you've actually, uh, one you're a founding member of and the other one you founded. I think it's called the, the Ruth Daughters of Canada, one group, mm -hmm. and the other one is the Girls Parliament. Yeah, Girls Government, yeah. Well, Girls Government is an ongoing, it's, it's been around my writing several times now. We get 13-year-old girls from uh, different backgrounds. We let the principals choose which girls they are. And they debate issues. They go to meet cabinet ministers that are in charge of the issues that they decide they want to focus on. And we go to Ottawa and they meet women in power in both places, which is really exciting for the girls. The girls have a press conference at Queen's Park. So they experience the life of a politician. And we've been doing it now. We're in our sixth year, going into our sixth year of doing that. And it's spread. So we uh, Donna Cansfield, who is a liberal, Elizabeth Whitmer, who is conservative, both of those women brought it into their writings. And now we're working with Equal Voice to do a template so that everybody across Ontario and across country, hopefully, can bring it into their writings. Lots and lots of requests for anybody can do it, men or women, but just to get girls at a particularly uh, good stage, I think, just as they're entering their teen years when all the cultural stuff kind of comes slamming down on them. I want to get them before that happens and get them excited about really being movers and shakers in the political f uh, world because I don't think girls get that message. Um, so that's that. And Ruth's Daughters was just to get, again, women involved in congregational life from all faiths around violence against women, that issue. We, I thought, you know, first of all, faith leaders need to, to step up. And that's who we focused on in Ruth's Daughters. So now, every time there's a new government, we invite faith leaders, they're almost all men usually, but occasional women, but all the male leaders come in and they sign on and they say, we are standing united against violence against women and our board of women from all faiths hold them to that. And that's a very fascinating process too. So we're trying to get congregations to think about this issue. Most congregations, most of the work in congregations is done by women. Um, and they do work for all sorts of other people. And I want them to start looking at themselves and how can we help ourselves for a change. And also in, here in Ontario, I know in, in Toronto alone, there's a, a looking at a report this morning and it says something like about almost 20% of the homeless are gay. Another 16% mm -hmm. are veterans. Um, it said that one in three that are sleeping outside are First Nations. Actually, it makes up 1% yeah. of the population. The question I have for you is, in an industrial nation like Canada, being the leader of industrial world, in a lot of sense of what we're putting out, uh, with our rich in natural resources and everything, how can we correct this problem so there's not so many homeless? I mean, you're gonna have some homeless, but a large percentage of the people in the, uh, that are living in the streets right now, they want a home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first and foremost is we have to do something about housing for the homeless, and we have dropped that ball way back. Uh, we really, as governments, have not been actively involved in housing since the early 90s, and that goes federally and provincially. So right now, in the province of Ontario, we have over 170,000 families waiting for affordable housing. The average wait list is 10 to 12 years. I literally can have, pe have had people die on affordable housing waiting lists because they don't come through in time. So that's ridiculous. Now, why is that the case? Because we haven't done any new bills to, to speak of, really, as a government for a long time. Um, we've done very, very little uh, for special needs folk. Uh, we have had very little input uh, from the federal government. We have no national housing strategy whatsoever. And the province hasn't done anything either. So that's what happens. And we haven't, I brought forward a bill for inclusionary zoning, which wouldn't even require a tax dollar, which just says, why don't we just allow cities 
to require of their developers that they set aside a certain number of units if they're doing a big development to be used as affordable housing. Uh, developers already negotiate money that's kicked back to the city for various things. Why not for housing? So um, again, this is a very simple bill. I'm hoping that it will be passed one day soon. But even, and that would provide about 12,000 new units a, a year. We're not even doing that. So we're doing virtually nothing on the housing file. Now compare us to a jurisdiction like Sweden that had less, has less people in it than Ontario. They're about 9 million people in Sweden. And they built 100,000 new units of housing a year for 10 years. They call it their million house program. So there is no housing problem in Sweden. There's no homelessness, per se, in Scandinavian countries. We find that hard to even believe over here. So the question is, we've, we've dropped the ball for a long, long time now. We've got to get on it. We've got to do something. Um, there's a whole lot of things we've got to do, uh, but certainly building housing and providing actual housing units is one of them. Also, you helped raise the minimum wage up to $10. And uh, watching your, your Google Hangout, and mm -hmm. you were talking about there's some people that are calling for it to be raised up to $14. Mm -hmm. I know that you're, you guys are struggling trying to raise it even to 11 What's happening with that? Well, the government promised to raise it to 11 and they, and they broke their promise. They did not raise it to 11 It should, should be at 11 right now, according to the bill that they passed themselves. So we're calling on the government to do the right thing, to step up. Now it should be probably $12 we factor in inflation, just in their in terms of their province promises. So um, look ahead. I'm, I'm absolutely planning on keeping active on that issue. So we're going into a new legislative se uh, session. I'm hoping to put that on the radar again this very fall. And you're also, uh, one of your roles in the, in the NDP party, you're, you're actually critic, I think, for the citizen citizenship and immigration. One policy that you're trying to introduce was recognizing foreign trained professionals uh, allowing their degrees and their experience to be recognized here in Canada. Um, how far do you feel we have to go further? Because there's a lot of veterans out there that need doctors. Oh, I know absolutely. there's an awful lot of people that need doctors. Right? Absolutely. Um, a a absolutely. Uh, and we have doctors driving cabs. I mean, there, it's not a joke. It's true. And yet many Ontarians, uh, only one in ten Ontarians, I think last time I saw, has a family practitioner. So what's the problem? Well, it's a good question. What is the problem? Again, we, I have to play the blame of this government. Hasn't done anything about it. Hasn't sat down with the Ontario College of Physicians and Surgeons and made it a priority to actually, you know, speed up the process to get your accreditation. I mean, I can understand in some senses, maybe even accounting or law where laws change country to country, but bodies don't change that much. Bodies are bodies. If you're trained to be a doctor in England, why does it take 10 years to become a doctor here? That's about what it takes to get your accreditation. Um, that's ridiculous. I mean, somebody could come over here in their 40s, and usually they're in their 30s or 40s, they've gone through medical school. Add another 10 years of school, people don't have the money, they don't have the time, and they just give up. And that tends to be what happens. I had a surgeon here who's living in the riding who literally goes back to his home country in Iran. He's a surgeon. We need surgeons desperately and works six months of the year and then comes back here six months of the year to be with his family because he, he again, it would have taken him about 10 years to get accredited here. So he'd rather live you know, bi-nationally than do that. It's crazy. And also I noticed uh, when I was looking at your profile, it actually you had, you're involved with these social uh, p program policies. Mm -hmm. What do you feel in the province of Ontario has to be, is desperately need at this time in regards to social programs? Oh, well, I mean, again, we have a huge poverty problem. It is a problem and it can be solved, just like any other problem. There's no reason that we should have one in four children living in poverty, and that's our stats. There is no reason for the, the horror of homelessness. There's no reason for it in an advanced, wealthy country like ours. So what do we need to do? We can always find money. Isn't it amazing for things like Pan Am Games? Um, we can always find money for, you know, all sorts of things that we may find questionable. Tax breaks for wealthy corporations, for example. Um, but never enough money for housing, never enough money for social assistance. Our social assistance rates are lower now in real dollar senses than they were in the 60s and the 70s. You used to be able to live on social assistance rates in Ontario. You can't anymore. If you're on ODSB, you're living below the poverty line, and that is, I think, abhorrent. I mean, what we're saying to people with a disability is that, you know, you uh, should be expected to live in poverty because you have a disability. I don't think that's civilized. I don't think it's ethical. For people who are just on Ontario Works, on social assistance, absolutely no way you could put a roof over your head on 
just under six hundred dollars a month. It's not going to happen. How do we expect people to live? We don't. We're we're condemning them to homelessness. And actually, what's stupid about it, it doesn't even make economic sense because it costs us more. Poverty costs us money. We estimate it costs us about three billion dollars a year because where do those people end up? They end up in emergency wards. Expensive. They end up in jails. Expensive again. Uh, this is a problem. They end up with involved with police services. Expensive again. If we just had gave people a home and gave them an adequate income, we could save ourselves money, not cost ourselves money. But the question is political will, and I I don't see it happening. I just don't see it happening right now in the in either our government in pro province or in the federal government, unfortunately. And the last question I have to ask sure. for you, I noticed uh, in your Google Hangout, you're talking about the infrastructure, the the electrical system, and yeah. other you know bridges, roads, everything in the province of Ontario. How do you feel that these issues should be addressed? Well, they're all of the issues that we've talked about. There's only one place that government gets its money, and that's from taxes. Uh, nobody wants to see the middle class and those on the margins pay more taxes. They're already taxed to the nines, and we are included in that in the Democratic Party. But the taxes on we the wealthy individuals and taxes on large corporations have been halved or more. They've literally, the, the graph looks like this over the last few decades, that's the problem. We used to have enough money to support our infrastructures. We used to have enough money to have provide housing for people. We used to have enough money to keep people out of poverty. I used, I used to be able to tell you the names of people who are homeless in the city of Toronto. They were characters, you knew who they were. There was the Queen of Sweden. There was the guy who used to hang out in front of the Eden Center. I mean, I remember my dad talking about soup kitchens in the 30s. I said, what is a soup kitchen? Now they're everywhere, now we have food banks everywhere. What's the difference? The difference is unfair taxation. Unfair taxation. Far too many taxes on those who can least afford to pay them, and far too few taxes on those who can most afford to pay them. So that's a simple answer to the problem. And there really is only one answer to that problem. That's that. And quickly, your, your website where people can actually contact sure. you if they have any other questions to ask? Yeah, well, first of all, you mentioned the Google Hangout. Please, if you have questions, always send them any way you can. Get them to me through Twitter, through Facebook. Uh, that's how I met you. Uh, through other venues, uh, just directly to our constituency office. That's 12 to 1230 every Friday. And you can actually, in live time, hear my answer directly to your question. Just phone in, and I'll answer it. Bingo. Um, so, uh, and I always try to get back to people. So uh, if there's something I can't answer, I will. Thank you very much. For your You're time. very welcome. Thank you.